Te Hoieri Pelorus Catchment Restoration Project is a partnership between the community, Tangata Whenua, Marlborough District Council and the government. It seeks to improve freshwater quality and biodiversity and be a leading example of community-driven environmental restoration. Cosmo Kentish Barnes is in the sounds to meet some farmers who have embraced the project. I'm Karen Morrison, um, a dairy farmer here in Linkwater, which is in the Marlborough Sounds. And the farm is um, 84 hectares. So we have 220 Frisian uh, with a few crossbreds. And we are surrounded by pine plantations on the hillside, but a native on one hill, a flat land through the middle, and there's water either end of the valley. Do you actively farm? the property with your parents? Yes, I do. Mum and Dad were um, semi-retired, but our staff member left us, so Mum and Dad have come back full-time until we decide whether we employ somebody else or whether we just plod along and do it ourselves. So what's your daily routine? Up in the morning, milk the cows. Um, At the moment, it's not till 5 o'clock, but when peak of season or during calving, it can be anything from 4 to 5 in the morning. And we milk once a day, so it's not flat out all the time. If there's work to do, that's fine. And if not, it allows me time to get involved with the, like, the, the Tahori project. So I'm a catchment coordinator for the area. Mm. Tell me about that. So the project was set up, I think it's three years ago now, in the area. So it covers all of the Polaris, Rye Valley, Camas Town area, with the aim to improve our waterways. So it was to try and you know help make all land use more efficient for our water. So how many farms are involved? I only do the link water portion of it and there's six of us in here that are involved. And we decided that we wanted to do some baseline water monitoring to see what the quality was like. So we had a starting point. There's been um, waterways fenced off, which we've had funding through the project for. There's a lot of native planting gone in, which has also been funded or had help in doing that. Most of us have released dung beetles as well. So that was all at the start, and we've now just continued doing that sort of work. And we're in the process at the moment, we're seven months in, of doing a second round of water monitoring to see how that compares to our first lot. So initially you wanted to identify what some of the issues were in your streams and drains. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't just monitor one spot with on the waterway. We had various spots so we could look and see is the issue maybe coming out of the forestry? Is it coming out of native bush? Is it off on farmland? And then try to work together as a group to sort out what the best way forward was. Mm. What are some of the issues that have turned up? Um, that it's not all just off the farmland. There's a lot of nitrates and things that are coming out of the gorse and broom that is within the forest or the pine plantations or even in the native bush. Um, E. coli that is in our waterways, some of it is off farmland but some of it is also from the native animals that are in the area, the deer and the pigs that play in our waterways. What are you going to do about this? We're working towards solutions so within the project they're helping us to work out what are the good ways forward so by doing plantations of our native trees it's helping to allow the filtering and excluding stock we can't do much about the native stock that are around but we do our best to contain them and there's a couple of areas that um, culverts that we could improve on so um, that also comes down to fish passage as well to make sure that the fish species that like to live in our streams can make it from the sea back up to their breeding grounds. So just trying to make that more effective as well. And one of these fish-friendly culverts has been installed on a neighbouring farm. Yes, they put in a culvert uh, just before Christmas, I think it was. Um, Had a demonstration day over there, so... It was not just them putting in a culvert, it was also an educational opportunity to explain to other other people as to why and how to do it. Yeah, and how important it is. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yep. Yesterday you held a soil workshop on the farm here. Tell me about that. Uh, very interesting. Uh, something I don't ever do is go out and just dig a hole in the paddock. <laughs> um, so Matt Oliver from Council was here as one of the science people and he dug the whole, instead of just turning over the top spade length, he was nearly a metre down to 
see the different layers of where your topsoil is, where your root systems go to, what your soil makeup is like. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. What did you find? First paddock we dug a hole in, we found that there was a compacted layer from where we'd maybe been working the paddocks, or working the paddock potentially at slightly the wrong time, it was too wet. And yet one of the other holes we found, we found the roots of a clover that went down probably just over the length of your hand. So it was quite interesting to see what was down there and how far things went. And what advice did he have for you and the other farmers there? Maybe you could look at, like we grow four different species within our pasture as it is, but he said that's good to be diverse in what you're feeding and maybe look at some other options of what we were, instead of having the four that we had, have a play and try something different as a, just as an example. What about the dung beetles? Is that a catchment-wide project? So there's been five farms in the valley here that have put dung beetles in. We all released at the same time, with the first ones being released in December of 21, and then released January 22, March 22, and about April 22. Um, four different varieties and I know there is a few farmers up within the Rye Valley and Canvastown area as well that have released Mm. dung beetles. Have you noticed any changes yet? It takes approximately five to nine years to see a vast change but for me there is a little bit of notice with not quite so much uh, dung patches within the paddocks. So they are starting to pull that dung down into the earth? Yes, yes, pull it down into the earth and Hopefully over time there won't be the runoff if we have a rain event of, of the dung then going into our waterways. And it also means too that potentially we won't need to use so much synthetic fertilisers. But we already don't use a lot of synthetic fertilisers. We try and avoid it. We will use it if necessary. What other non-chemical options do you have here? We use all our effluent goes into holding pond. Some people only put it over a small portion of their farm, whereas we put it over the whole lot. We have an effluent tanker so we can concentrate on where we want to go. If it's wet, then we don't put it in certain spots, and if it's dry, we can afford to put a little bit more on. Yep, so you're recycling. Yes, recycling. Do you find that this is fascinating? Are you really enjoying this catchment work? Yes, I am. I'm learning lots. Um, Some things I didn't know a lot about to do with the water and what was going on in other areas so it was quite interesting to see that some of the issues that we were having in here was also happening more widespread so being able to work together on trying to solve things was a lot better. So is this catchment project reducing the stress levels of having to comply with new farming regulations? Some of it has yes Um, and with the project's help it's made it like some farmers might have the time to do their fencing but they don't have the money for the materials and vice versa they might have the money for the materials but not the fencing so with the project's help there is options around that so they can get contractors in to help help do that sort of thing and maintain our plants as well but funding's due to run out in june 25. how do you convince other farmers to give something a go Well, we've kind of gone along the lines of those that are willing and able and want to get involved. Hopefully the person sitting watching over the fence, seeing what we're doing, will then go, well, why can't I be doing this too, or how can I be involved? So there's no point putting pressure on people because then they just stick their toes in and they don't want to do anything at all. So your job really is to get them to keep on progressing in this direction? Yep, and do what they can when they can, because we do have financial and other responsibilities that come before sometimes having to do this. And with with payouts dropping and things like that, sometimes it is hard that you need to actually balance, hold, I need to survive here. Um, It's my livelihood. Karen cranks up her side by side and takes me up the valley to meet her dad, Nigel. He's waiting for us on a stock bridge that crosses a fenced-off stream. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm pretty good, yeah. The sun's shining and it's warm, so it must be good. Lovely day, a bit windy. bit windy, yeah, Mm. yeah. Mm. How long have you been been here? Father came here in 1950. He got the, the original part of the farm as a rehab farm, as a return serviceman. And over the years we've brought two neighbours out. 
and um, I was born here. So the only way I'll leave here probably is in a box. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go to school? I went to Lickwater School. There was one teacher. We had one teacher for our whole primary school. We only lived just under a K from the school. We used to have to walk to school or ride a bike if the tyres weren't flat. And then we had to come home at lunchtime for lunch because Mum always had a cooked lunch. Yeah, that was quite interesting. As kids, we did all sorts of things we shouldn't do on the way home and get into trouble. <laughs> As you do. Yeah, yeah, that's dead right, yeah. And then I went through to Marlborough College, Boys College, and did two years there and thought I was fully educated and left. <laughs> Came home on the farm. And you've been farming ever since? Yeah, so I'm 71 now, so I've been here a couple of years, yeah. Do you love it? I do, yeah, yeah. It's a way of life. It has its good and bad points, but you wouldn't get me living in town. I just, just love this and the community. Mm. Nigel, why have we stopped here? This area here is it's a major stream, the Cullinsville stream that runs through here. And through the Tahori project and Marlborough District Council, we've been encouraged to plant trees. And under government regulations, we've had to fence the waterways. And we're planting it with natives now. So trying to enhance it. The willows have done a good job retaining the banks, but it's to a point where they're coming out and we're replanting it all. Are you enjoying this planting journey? I am. I've went through a stage with my father when we first started on the farm. The, the idea was if it was a tree, it had to be cut down. And it was there, mm. there, developing land. And I've got to a point now thinking, well, we need to go back and get some more natives and stuff going. So... Um, probably for a start we were, why do we have to do this? But we can see why now. We've had some really good workshops through the water things that Karen's been doing. So it's given us an insight to where we are with our water. We've done a lot of water testing so we know what, what problems are. So by putting these natives in we're hopefully going to rectify some of those problems. So that's what we're doing. Are you noticing a change since you've put the natives in? Yeah, um, not so much here in the creek, they're, not, they're only young, but on another part of our property we've planted a, a big native area and the tuis and stuff are starting to come back into it, so it's really neat to go down there and see them. So that was one of the reasons we've, we could have put other um, species in, but I've stipulated it all has to be natives. You want those birds sure on the do. farm? Yeah, that's for real, yeah. And um, we, we had, alongside our house, we had a big block of flaxes there for a number of years, and the tuis that came into there was unreal. So that's what, what I want to see back and provide a corridor for it to happen. Mm. And what about fencing? On this property, we are probably 110% fenced, and that was through choice. We've always been proactive and doing stuff and not being told to do it. If you get to that situation, it can cost you a lot more money. And in hindsight, it's made our management of the farm so much better. And like alongside us here is a bridge that was put in the year the big earthquake was in Christchurch. And that went from a, a $50,000 bridge to nearly 100000 because the specs kept going up. And we weren't happy but in hindsight, it's the best thing we ever did. So before you had the bridge put in, the stock would just have to walk through the creek, they I guess? They walk through the creek, and as soon as the cow's hooves touched the water there, they mucked in the water. So there's none of that now, and this creek can be volatile in the, in the winter, or even in the spring. And now we don't have to worry about it. The cows are quite safe, and there's no animals in the creek at all. What would your father think about the changes you're making here? Oh, I think he'd be quite proud of what we're doing but initially what are you doing boy would be yeah his, his answer but <laughs> I think when he can see or could see where it's coming to he'd be quite proud of it. And you've also been putting native trees into a plot near the local school? Yes we have we've got about a hectare we've planted We've done that off our own bat. It cost us about $20,000 to establish it. But where it is, is only a few hundred metres from the school. 
and when we planted it we involved all the school children, the preschool and the local people and through that now it is open to the public. So we've had tremendous um, community support for it mm. and we had a, a special seat made and put down there so us older ones can go down and sit on it. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> yeah, so like now the trees are established, the children can, can go back there if the teachers wish and identify trees and mm. some of them can look at them and say, well, perhaps I planted that one. And it'll get them into the spirit of looking after trees and that type of thing. So it's quite gratifying. Tanya and Murray Frost's dairy farm is across the road from the Morrisons. We bought the farm in 2012. Uh, it was quite run down, I suppose you could call it. Um, we've refenced most of the farm. We've double cropped every paddock to get rid of brown top. We've put three water schemes in and we've extended the cow shed from a 24 a side to a 40 a side. Plus, we've done all the effluent and we've been planting out. We were doing this before it was required and um, we've had a new big culvert put in. Mm. How would you describe the valley you farm in? I've always thought of it as a basin. It's like this little, you go through all these windy roads, through all the bush, and then you come to a big open basin, and it sort of just comes up and down on each side. It's, it's beautiful farming in here. Mm. So it's not real steep. It's flat to sort of rolling up the sides. So we go right to the top of that ridge. And what happens over the hills? So over the hill we've got Matapu Bay, so that takes us into the Pelora Sound, and then you can go round the corner about five minutes and you're in the Queen Charlotte Sounds. Mm. And you're involved with the uh, local catchments that Karen coordinates? Yes, correct, with the Tahori project, yep. And it's going brilliantly. We're all working in as a team in the whole district, which is quite nice. And Murray, we're going to head down to a creek to see some work you've done there. Yes, yeah, we're going to have a look at the, the culvert that was put in with the Marlborough District Council and the Tahori project. And then we'll have a look at some fencing, fencing off some waterways and some wetlands. Excellent. Let's head out onto the farm. The creek runs past paddocks of grass and corn as it heads towards the sea. Beneath an overpass that cows use to get to the milking shed is the new and bigger culvert. A healthy volume of water is flowing through it. We've replaced two 800mm culverts. One culvert was completely blocked with gravel. Yes. And they've been replaced with two 1500mm culverts. And how important is that for the fish? Yeah, yes, and now the fish can swim up it. The culverts are 25% of them are buried under the, 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 the bottom of the river. Mm. So, so, so the fish can swim up through them. What sort of native fish migrate through these culverts? Um, Enunga mainly. There's eels. Yeah. White bait. Uh, this one, this one here is tidal. The, the, a high tide pushes up through this culvert, and um, you, you see quite a few white bait come up through here. How satisfying is it, knowing that these fish have got a nice clear route now? Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they've got a good path up here, and, and um, yeah, we've got some more culverts we want to replace. With bigger culverts, a lot of our culverts are too small. We'll try and do at least one or two of them at crossings a year. And does that mean that native fish will be able to get right up to the top of the valley then? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, here's a, here's a couple of the first kowai trees we planted along the edge here. They're doing well, aren't they? Yeah, and this this was only fenced one side, now it's fenced both sides. So with the Tahori project, with the planting, you got two options. One, they'll pay for the plants and you do all the work. You pay for the plants and they'll do all the work, so we actually opted for them to pay for the plants. And you did all and the work? And we do all the work, so we do all the planting, all the cleaning around them. You, you had to take the option that you could afford, really. Yeah. And this way here, yes, it's more work for us, but that's the way we've done it, right yes. through. We've just had a look at the culvert that you've put in, and now we're heading to a wetland that you've got. Yep. So we're still um, doing more fencing, more waterways. Um, we're doing smaller ones that don't actually need to be fenced, but they'll be fenced. We've put dung beetles in, but we're just waiting to see the results. This is one of the paddocks. This is the paddock we did our first release in. Yes, it is. 
this one here. So the dung beetles will probably work from one farm to the next, they will actually intermingle. So, especially at this end, because we've got Morrisons and Templemans and Parks and ourselves, we've all released them, so it's going to be quite a spread of them. And we are walking through a paddock towards <laughs> your wetland and yeah we're just walking over the irrigation hose. What have you got growing in here? Uh, there's pittosporums, some ekiex, manukas. manukas, quite a lot of manukas, um, flaxes, cabbage trees. And what was here before? Well, it was just rushes and wheat and the cows used to walk through it. It was really part of the paddock. It was, it was just the bog. They make they make a bog. They come in with their legs all dirty and their udders dirty to milk, yes. which creates mastitis. And um, yeah, it was just good for nothing. So we fenced it off and it's going to make nice shelter when the plants get up. So it's a win-win. It's good for the cows and for milking, and it's good for your environmental footprint. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so, so this goes right down to the, the Makapa Arm. Yeah, you've done quite a bit of fencing and planting all the way down there. It kind of yeah. weaves its way down towards the estuary. Yeah, yeah, yes. And you were saying that you were doing native plantings well before the catchment started the project. Yeah, my father-in-law actually used to collect native plants out of reserves and that, that were just going to be killed off. And he'd come over here in his 80s and plant them out, take the kids with them and clear all around them and, yeah. What a lovely link to the farm. Yeah, yeah. No, so he, yeah, he used to love doing that, didn't he, Murray? Yeah. Linkwater farmer Tanya Frost ending that story. Cosmo was also talking to Murray Frost, Karen Morrison and her dad, Nigel Morrison.